Here's a report of anatomist Dr. Helmuth Benneke after analyzing the corpse of a 16-year-old young man. Right arm held out in a fencing position, found lying totally on his back in the street. Scorched head hair, skin on the feet is charred. Chin and tip of the nose dried up and burnt. Superficial charring on the extensor side of the hands. Skin color reddish brown. Rump muscles appear as if boiled. Tongue surface dry and brownish. Lungs are distended, voluminous, heavy. An abundance of thickened blood in the right heart. The left heart is empty. Liver is hard. Spleen is melted away. Nope. This isn't some serial killer's doing. The doctor's assessment was that the young man was burnt alive on the street. A street of Dresden, a German city that melted away in the Second World War. But how does an entire city melt? Tin does, plastic does, but an entire city full of buildings and parks and people? Keep watching to find out. Hello, hello and welcome to another episode of Eyeshadow and Itihas. I am Dr. Ruchika Sharma. I teach history for a living and I do have a few more credentials that have been listed in the description box. Eyeshadow and Itihas is a passion project wherein in each episode I do an eyeshadow look like this one while talking about a particular topic of history. So in case history interests you or eyeshadows or both, do consider subscribing. Besides this, underneath every video, there's a super thanks button in case you want to make any monetary donation to the channel. Before I introduce you to the topic, know that there is a list of sources mentioned in the description box that are related to today's episode. In case you want to read them out of sheer curiosity or in case you want to fact check whatever I say in the video. Now that all that is over, let me introduce the topic. This episode is the first in a new series I'm starting on the channel, a world history series. I've been wanting to do this for a while now. Um, the series will cover some fascinating facets of histories other than that of India, which has so far been the main thing covered on my channel. The series will be primarily in English, but I will also add captions in Hindi since I know a significant amount of my audience is also Hindi speaking. The reason for keeping the world history episodes in English is pretty self-explanatory. I wanted to reach as many people as possible. Topics on Indian history will however continue to be in Hindi with the subtitles in English. There are uh, many such videos already on the channel, you can check them out. Now today's episode, if you've seen the preview, deals with a dark period of history. Possibly the darkest for humankind. And unlike the misnomer, dark ages, for what is now correctly known as the early middle ages, this period was truly dark. Not just in terms of how much violence it exposed a significant portion of the world to, but also because its effects can still be seen on humanity and are mostly quite bleak. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's the unprecedented violence of Second World War. The destruction that has no parallel in history. And weapon science is to be largely blamed for this. Especially the science and the detailed precision behind aerial bombing. Yep, literal stuff of nightmares. You're in the comfort of your homes, thinking you're safe, but the enemy's bomber plane can change that in seconds. That's more or less what happened in Dresden too. A flourishing German city where aerial bombing is said to have caused temperatures to rise as high as 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. That's approximately 982 degrees Celsius. But how was this horrible feat achieved? Surely not all aerial bombing produces such devastating effects in a city. And what led to this utter brutality? And why only Dresden? How much was the level of destruction in terms of lives lost and otherwise? The reason why I used more or less what happened a while ago is also to pay homage to the dark humour cult favourite, the novelist Kurt Vonnegut, who was interestingly an eyewitness to this absolute carnage. 
In fact, he wrote an entire book about it. How does he describe the events? And lastly, a question that we must always ask each time there's mindless violence. Was this necessary? All of this in today's episode. Chale Pir. So first of all, a bit about Dresden. It's a city in Germany and is famously called as the Florence on the Elbe. The Elbe being the river that flows through Dresden, the comparison to the city of Florence, owing to the fact that Dresden had some stunning Baroque architectural masterpieces, numerous museums and some really scenic views, man. Despite being the seventh largest city in Germany, Dresden had escaped a major air attack from the Allied forces for five long years during the Second World War. And it was more or less understood that seeing as it was one of the jewels of Europe, it would be free from violence all the way till the end of the Second World War. It was this naivet that made the city quite complacent and left largely without a strong defense. No one thought it would be Dresden. But when it comes to wars armed with destructive science, the unthinkable always happens. So why Dresden? Seems like a quaint little town. Who could hate it and why? To understand that, let's quickly recap that in 1944, when the attack on Dresden was being planned, where were the powers that be in the Second World War? The Allied powers, Britain, America, USSR, and to some extent France, although it was significantly under Germany by then, were in a pretty good position vis-a-vis -vis the Axis powers, specifically Italy and Germany. Japan was a harder nut to crack and would probably require multiple episodes to explain. The Allies were looking towards a victory, maybe a Pyrrhic one, since so many Allied soldiers had been unalived by the German Blitzkrieg or lightning attacks, which were ironically powered by the German Luftwaffe, its air force that was a terror in the sky. Speed had been Hitler's trump card in war. He, however, never thought that the war would drag on forever, slowing down the fastest of them all. And that's what was happening in 1944. You see, this wasn't a 100-meter sprint. This was a marathon. And Hitler and his resources, having run at full power in the beginning, were now quite stretched and deeply exhausted towards the end. Primarily because of the Soviet advance the relentless Red Army that was the largest in the world during this time. So in order to reverse what was now more likely the outcome of the war, which was an allied win, Hitler was concentrated on taking Antwerp, the largest port in Europe, but also the transport and communication center for the allies, where food, ammunition, etc. were passed from America and Britain to fight against the Axis powers. Antwerp being towards the west of Germany, as you can see here, Hitler's war efforts were now directed there, while its eastern half, which is where Dresden lies, was largely defenseless, giving the Red Army the golden opportunity to not just attack and occupy eastern German front, but also to occupy the German-occupied countries of Czechoslovakia, Austria, Poland, etc. And that's where the Dresden Carnage's ostensible purpose comes in. The stated purpose was that Dresden lay in the middle of the east-west north-south traffic of the German forces. That is, if their German troops were to move from west to east and uh, north to south or vice versa, they had to pass by Dresden. Plus, it also lay at the junction of three main routes of the German railways. However, if this was really true, and the aim was to take down the German railway system, then the railway bridge over the River Elbe would be targeted. But in the Dresden air raid, that was one of the things that remained untouched. In fact, the bridge wasn't even an attack target for the British, who bombed Dresden in 1945. The real purpose, therefore, was quite unsettling. You see, Dresden, since it had managed to stay away from the war for a prolonged period of time, was home to a large number of refugees. These were not just people from other German cities that were caught in the maelstrom of the war, but also the refugees from other countries that were fleeing the rapid advance of the Red Army. Not all were living in Dresden, but all were certainly passing through Dresden to get to safer shores. 
given, as we have discussed, how central Dresden was. Dresden was therefore part of the Allied communications targets that also included other German cities of Leipzig and Berlin. The idea was to create a refugee chaos in Dresden so that as the Red Army continues with its rapid advance in the Eastern Front, German troop reinforcements cannot be sent swiftly to the East from other directions. Remember, Dresden is central to the East-West North-South German troop movements. The refugees, basically civilians, were being used as a human wall that would hinder troop movement. A major human rights red flag. This was when in September 1939, Franklin D. Roosevelt, the then President of the United States, had appealed to every government involved in the war to not be the first to bomb civilians and Britain had signed this. And even though Britain was not the first to bomb civilians, it was Germany in Warsaw, Poland, Britain, however, continued to deny for a protracted amount of time that they had essentially used and bombed civilians to ensure quicker victories in war, that too, refugees. What made this worse is that most of the refugees in Dresden were women, children and old people. And they were bombed not just to delay troop movements, but also to show the Red Army what the British Bomber Command could do. And that they really did well. Since Dresden has been regarded as Britain's biggest military success in the entire Second World War. Yep, Britain's biggest military success was air bombing a defenseless city full of refugees. Wow, how very mighty of them. But before we discuss at length how Britain managed to melt a city within hours, why was Britain trying to impress the Soviet Union? Despite being on the same side of the war, both Britain and America were in constant competition with the Communist Soviet. The Soviet military strength that had humbled Germany had already scared both US and Britain. And therefore, both these nations wanted to send strong signals to the Soviet that they were equally powerful. Britain did it with Dresden, while US would do it with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So how did Britain achieve their biggest military success though? The trick to melt a city, ladies and gentlemen, is to start a raging firestorm. One that keeps kindling for days on end. And this boiler room maneuver requires a lot of precision. This precision came with practice. Much before Dresden happened in 1945, there was already the German city of Darmstadt, which was aerial bombed to kindle a firestorm in September 1944. The human losses here also were immense, even though it was but a trailer to the entire performance that the number 5 group gave in Dresden. No, the number 5 group wasn't a rock band or the name of a fancy luxurious perfume. It was the British Royal Air Force's bomber group in the Second World War. They had bombed Darmstadt and had perfected their craft of singeing an entire city. On 13th February 1945, one Mosquito plane, which is basically a two-engine plane and 244 other Lancaster planes, four-engine planes, left Britain at 7.57pm for Dresden. The Mosquito plane was the master bomber and was the first to arrive which gave instructions to the other 244 bombers to get into a fan formation over the old part of Dresden. There was little time to lose since the bombers had only come with 2200 gallons of fuel with no reserves. And in this, they also had to get back to Britain, a 900 mile journey home. So they precisely had around 25 minutes to cause absolute havoc from 10.03 to 10.25. Once the fan formation was complete and the targets had been locked, there were only 12 minutes to drop the bombs. The first to be dropped were high explosives that shattered windows, crumbled roofs, basically reduced structures to bits, forcing people to run out of their homes. After these came the actual force majeure, so to speak, the ones that would create the desired firestorm. The incendiary bombs, which as the name suggests, were to cause the city to go up in flames. It were these that caused 60% of the damage. But there was more to come. 
As the number five group was departing after dropping the incendiary bombs, another set of Lancaster, this time 550 in number, arrived for a second round of attack. The first group had only been able to carry 877 tons of bombs, which were not thought to be enough by Bomber Harris, who ordered another round. Bomber Harris was the famed moniker for Arthur Harris, head of the Royal Air Force Bomber Command from 1942 to 1945. Harris regarded melting cities to be at the heart of strategic bomber offensive. Given how much he loved bombing helpless civilians, man must have retired in gleeful happiness, knowing he was called Bomber Harris. The Starbucks barista would still call out his name as Domba Staris or something, so pipe down, uncle. The second round of attack was even more devastating than the first one. It multiplied the casualties. You see, the first round of attack had forced the Dresdeners outside to cooler areas as the city began burning up. These cooler areas were the Great Garden, the banks of the Elbe, and the basement cellars. Dresden, unfortunately, did not have bunkers. And it was these three areas that were the target of the second round of attack. The hospital staff of the hospitals of Dresden, after the first round, brought the patients out into the Great Garden and laid them on the grass. Many thinking that the attack was over came out of the cellars. But then the sirens went up again and the master bomber gave commands, the fan being directly above the great garden. As the bombs lashed, the master bomber bled. That's nice bombing, as if it was a dress or something. The absolute lack of humanity really shocks you, doesn't it? Those who managed to survive this second attack ran back to the basement cellars, but that was a huge mistake. By now, the fires in the city were leaping up towards the sky, visible from 100 miles away. This created copious amounts of carbon monoxide that entered the basement cellars, suffocating thousands of people who were taking shelter in it. The blast of hot air was quite overpowering outside too, where people were roasted in hot air. The rising temperatures caused the tar in the roads to melt, sticking to people's shoes and stripping them off it, burning their bare feet. The immense heat caused many to drop their clothes to cool themselves, but there was no relief. The city was blazing and many died naked by inhaling noxious fumes in the streets. But there was still more to come. As Dresdeners were battling for their life, at noon on the 14th of February, the American bombers arrived that dropped bombs on the railway marshalling yards. One of those rare places now in Dresden that was still holding a few alive. Yet, they wouldn't be spared. The 31 B-17 bombers of the 1st Air Division dropped 771 tons of bombs, including 294 tons of incendiary bombs. And if you think this was the last straw, then you're absolutely wrong. For Dresden, it was no mercy. So on 15th February, 210 B-17 American bombers that were to target a synthetic oil plant but were unable to reach it dropped those bombs on Dresden as a second option. What you say, you can't bomb an oil plant? Oh, no worries. Let's take down some civilians instead in a city that's already burning up like hellfire. These bombers dropped 461 tons of bombs. Three days and four rounds of bombing later, Dresden was still burning up and horror stories abound. One such horror account came from Victor Gregg, a British soldier kept in Dresden as a prisoner of war and awaiting execution. Part of the jail blew up, so he was free, but was soon rounded up and asked to help in the rescue efforts. He reports that in one shelter, when they opened the door, what first hit them was an acrid smell, and then they saw the horror from which it emanated. And I quote, a glutinous mass of solidified fat and bones swimming around, inches thick on the floor. The fire had melted these bodies together. Many such bodies were glued to each other and unrecognizable. 
A true body count of how many lost their lives in Dresden's three days of firestorm is still unavailable, but there are estimates. The most exaggerated estimate was made famous by another one of the famous prisoners of war in Dresden during the raids, the popular novelist Kurt Vonnegut, who in his fictional masterpiece, Slaughterhouse Five, quoted the figure to be as high as 135,000 and compared the firestorm at Dresden to be as bad as Hiroshima. We love you, Kurt, but no. The conservative estimate is 25,000, but some also take it to be as high as 40,000 and double these figures were the wounded. Only the bare bones of the city remained and the city continued to smolder for weeks. The New York Times reported this rather gleefully. 8,000 planes batter Nazis close to two fronts. Dresden hit thrice as Russians move on it. The use of the blanket term Nazis for all that were hit by these attacks made the attacks sound justifiable. That many were just refugees and civilians was a fact missed or conveniently omitted. Which brings us to, were the attacks on Dresden really necessary? British Commodore Grierson, when questioned on the whys of the Dresden raids, said that they wanted to stop movement in all directions possible. If possible, movement of everything. Yet, neither of the double attacks of the Royal Air Force targeted the railway's bridge at the Elbe. The aftermath of Dresden was a whole lot of managing PR in America and UK so that Dresden did not look like the human rights blunder that it really was. And that is all for today's episode. Do let me know in the comment section what you thought about this episode. And in case you liked the episode, then do press the like button, share the video and also subscribe to the channel. And do let me know in the comment section what topic of world history interests you and you would like to see me talking about in the next episode in the world history series. And before I say goodbye, here's a reminder, there is a list of sources in the description box which pertain to today's topic in case you want to read it out of sheer curiosity or you want to fact check everything that I've said in this video.